Joining me today over a coffee at the Grand Central Cafe is Petros Astavisius, Liberal Lithuanian MEP. We talk about Russia, about American democracy, the future of European democracy and Catalonia. Why did you get into politics? I always uh, wanted to be a part of change. And uh, I guess my generation had no choice. I come from the country which uh, in, uh, in the last 25 years, I mean, saw so much of change. And uh, it simply become uh, a part of my blood. Uh, first starting from uh, public service, then I joined uh, politics because uh, I wanted to accelerate, to do something in a different way than I saw before. You started, uh with a great academic career. By 31, you were Lithuania's youngest ever ambassador. And now today we see Sebastian Kurz as the, the new chancellor of Austria at 31 as well. Do you have confidence that someone at that age has the capacity to lead the country? I'm not afraid of uh, young leaders. Uh, many of them might fail, but uh, you know, I mean, life is in, a, in a such a tempo for the time. Uh, and I think we need to, to adjust to that um, change in uh, having uh, different generations involved. What's different about Petrus today and Petrus as the young ambassador at 31? Well, I become uh, more, more realistic, probably. Then I was overambitious. I was really dreaming about uh, many things, but uh, I never forgot about that. I mean, uh, Lots of uh, dreams, I mean, are in, in, in myself. I mean, uh, I am a kind of uh, very continuation-based person. Uh, I went for presidential elections in 2004. And in uh, 19, uh, I might take up uh, this chance again, because uh, I see it um, not just as my personal achievement. Uh, I see it as, as my team's uh, advance as a possibility to, to do something uh, in what I believe. You have very personal experience dealing with Russia. Are you still blacklisted by Russia? Oh, yes, I am. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank <And> you. <laughs> the, the prospect of Europe changing its relationship with Russia, do you see it more as a matter of diplomacy, a matter of trade and money? How do we improve our relationship with Russia? Well, it's a matter of both sides. Uh, I think the EU should not blame itself because of the state of play uh, in relations with uh, the Russian Federation. President Putin is uh, very ambitious, but uh, his ambition is, uh, is based not on, uh, on, a, on a kind of wish, I mean, to make Russia better, but uh, to blame others. I mean, uh, because What motivates others... Putin, though? What, what really drives him to act in this way in the first instance? I don't believe, I mean, he has a strategy. And if you don't have a strategy, then, I mean, the easiest way, I mean, to point out, I mean, to your neighbors and to uh, tell your people, I mean, these are our enemies. I mean, we have to do, I mean, we have to raise our profile at the expense of them. Well, do you see a difference between the Kremlin and the Russian nation, or are they more or less aligned today? No, they are not. Uh, look, I mean, if you control uh, media, and it's almost for, uh, 95 and more percent. If you control uh, opposition and uh, you simply have no opposition, I mean, figures uh, uh, in politics, uh, you're in complete uh, control of this society. It didn't work out so well for the Tsar in the past, and Russia has a, a habit of uh, creating revolution. Do you see a tipping point where the Putin regime simply is challenged to a point it can't survive? I think economy is, uh, is the biggest channel, uh, challenge for, uh, for Putin. Are you more worried by ag aggressive action such as that we saw in Ukraine? Or are you more worried about the undermining of democracy by fake news, by propaganda coming from Russia? I mean, fake news is, um, is a well-developed uh, and a very well-established uh, principle of politics in, in, uh, in the Russian Federation. What's so different about what we have today? Certainly the speed is different, the speed of activity is different, and the ease of reach. But what's the difference between what we see now in terms of propaganda with Russia from Khrushchev's day and what happened after that as well? The, the state was hugely influential. It still had an impact outside as well. It still had a lot of friends outside pushing policies in Russia's favor. Um, what's so different? Well, I think we, we should uh, clearly understand 
a major difference which exists between a let's say Cold War propaganda and present propaganda uh, coming from uh, Kremlin. In a Cold War time, uh, that propaganda was based on superiority of socialist, so-called socialist system, which never existed, sorry to say. I lived in that system. It was against people. I mean, socialism can't be against people. I mean, it should be in favor of people, I mean, of well-being of people and so on. But it was about the superiority, so-called superiority of the system, ideology. Now, I mean, the Russian propaganda is simply against the Western values, I mean, Western system, which is uh, well established and produces so, so many and good results for uh, countries which believe in that. Do you think people like Steve Bannon and the huge influence that Bannon has can still over uh, President <clears throat> Trump, Bannon describes himself as a Leninist in strategy, if not in, in uh, some other ideals. Where it is the destruction of the state, of the government. It's, it's an anarchist viewpoint. Does Bannon have more in common with Putin than many Western leaders understand? I mean, strangely, sometimes uh, those ideologies which are based on uh, so different criteria, I mean, uh, original criteria or principles, uh, find each other. And uh, when I listen to, to Bannon's uh, speeches and, uh, and his critics uh, about West and, and, and US and, and uh, dem democracy uh, as such, well, I find myself uh, almost listening I mean, to, to some uh, Russian propag uh, propagandists. It seems uh, like a, a kind of Matthew organization mentality of, of consumption and, and greed for personal gain with an explanation by any other means. But what happens when President Trump is removed? at some point, whether of, of his own volition or someone else's or the electorate's. <clears throat> there is a core remaining within America, and, and we now see elements across Europe, that has its mentality transformed to oppose liberal democracy. And do you see that as a persistent threat on a scale which will completely undermine our liberal democracy? Or do you think it's something that is a phase and will evaporate over time as the economy recovers, as other factors change? I don't see it's uh, purely based on economic development. Uh, uh, the uh, standard of living in the US is pretty high. I mean, uh, right, I mean, we have some states which uh, fall behind even uh, less developed countries, but uh, it's exceptional. Uh, the average, average is very high. I think the US should be proud, I mean, on uh, all those things they achieved over, over decades and, uh, and centuries. But, uh, uh, mentality which is, is probably based on uh, different things, uh, of kind of uh, superiority, of uh, being number one. I see a lot of uh, hostilities between uh, Europe and, and US. I wouldn't panic too much. Uh, look, uh, I think we, we have a base of stability. Uh, we didn't uh, lose our minds. Uh, we, we control things, uh, generally speaking. Uh, well, there are some surprises in elections, but not much, I, would, uh, I should admit. If you look just on that point that there are those who influence who are not politicians, you can look back to Plato and Aristotle. You can look to Shakespeare, who was criticizing the, the, the crown at that time as well, commenting aside. You go to Dickens, all these people, not today as well, I, you see in France, Victor Hugo also. So all these great writers and, and uh, polemic uh, expressionists at the time, they had this impact, they drew the crowds, and they changed the mentality in, in their countries, and it didn't all fall apart, or did it? Those opinions are generated by people, by ordinary people, which is a bit different. I mean, uh, I don't challenge them uh, as, um, <laughs> as personalities, not at all. I, I don't think we, we, uh, we're in a position just to follow well-described or uh, fought intele um, by intellectuals. So now we are in a kind of uh, mass production stage uh, of uh, opinions and, uh, and, and news in which many people are a bit lost. Catalonia, it seems this is not a retractable problem in the near term. How do you think it sh this will play out? How do you think it should play out? I don't see easy solution from, uh, for Catalonia uh, and um, Spain in general. I don't think it's, uh, uh, we should uh, simplify the situation. Dialogue uh, is, is a must, and it should be uh, as soon as possible understood by Madrid and uh, Barcelona. I see already positive signs on Barcelona's side. 
I wish I mean I, I saw more on on Madrid side. It's a civilized country, and uh, that uh, situation should be conflict situation should be settled uh, uh, around the table. What's the alternative? Alternative. I mean a standoff. I mean uh, I don't believe uh, politicians in Catalonia will. Uh, um, uh, will roll, uh, roll back, I mean, from the positions. Do you think Madrid will risk bloodshed? I hope not. I don't, uh, I don't uh, look at that option. There are rational people. Um, I call on them, I mean, uh, sit and talk. Finally, when you tell someone to read a book that this will change their life, what do you recommend? You know, I'm a, a man of no, uh, no one book. I don't believe one book might change uh, your, uh, your world, of, uh, your way of understanding of the world. Uh, but uh, don't forbe- uh, forget about classics. I like history. Uh, I am still fa- uh, fascinated by my country's history. But I hope for one thing, that uh, technological change uh, will not change uh, a nature of, uh, of a man. And technologies will be only helping us, I mean, to overcome our difficulties, not prevailing uh, our faults. Petrus Astavisius, thank you. Thank you so much.